All right. Hello, hello, my friends. Today is a very good day. And by now, if you're familiar with this channel, you know exactly why. Boop, 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 boop. Well, your day can be good for a variety of reasons, but mine especially is because we are going to be talking all about this lovely 1938 Chevy Master Deluxe Coupe. It's going to be awesome. So, let's do it. types of car stuff. We do car history, drive videos, you name it. If I can get my hands on it, I really like to make a video of it. And we are inside of my family mechanic shop that we've had for over 40 years. We have some of the best customers. So nice, in fact, that they will let me make a video on their fantastic classic cars. Case in point, thank you so much to Rick and Dee Beekman for letting me make a video on their absolutely gorgeous, stunning, 1938 Chevrolet Master Deluxe. Thank y'all. And if you like these kind of videos, well then you should certainly press the subscribe button, which is either somewhere over there, somewhere over here, I never remember. One of these. Now, I'm gonna behave. I'm not gonna dive too deeply in the history of Chevrolet, but of course I'm going to indulge a little bit in talking about the man in which Chevrolet is named for, and that is Swiss race car driver and engineer Louis Chevrolet, okay? The guy was an overall ass. Total, totally cool. Very smart, very clever, and self-made. So, he is very talented, catches the eye of William C. Durant, all right? And that is Durant of General Motors, that's right. And really, I could do an entire video on each of these guys, okay? But we're not going to do that right now. I'm going to behave. So I changed up the position and the lighting on this. It's pretty elementary around here. It's just my cell phone on a tripod and whatever car I can get my hands on. But I think this lighting is better. And it might be better for sound too because a second ago the camera, my phone, was below my Porsche 912e and I think that was creating kind of an echo. I don't know. Maybe not. But I think it was. Okay. Let's get back to business. Alright. So we're going to cover a little bit about William C. Durant. Really, he was an automotive pioneer. He was one of the first entrepreneurs to create a huge automotive company by simply buying up a bunch of smaller automobile companies. And that's how we would see General Motors. And really, he set the trend because that's pretty much all that goes on now in the automotive arena and manufacturing world. So interesting. So he would create General Motors. He would promptly get booted off once sales plummeted. He would then start Chevrolet with Louis, Louis Chevrolet, and within 10 years, he'd be, honestly, right back on top of General Motors. That is some perseverance right there. And now a little bit of background about Louis Chevrolet. So his first dive into mechanics was through bicycles, which was frankly very common. He then would immigrate to Canada, find his way to New York, begin working at the De Dion, manufacturing facility in Brooklyn and this is going to be a little digression right now but I love De Dion Bouton cars and they have a really interesting story in that so they really where they succeeded mainly is parts manufacturing very similar to how the Dodge Brothers first made their big chunk of change was supplying parts to other car manufacturers kind of cool so he was working for De Dion, and then he would eventually begin racing for Fiat, and then he would switch over to Buick and race for Buick. And it was while he was racing for Buick that Chevrolet would meet Durant and their partnership would form. And it wasn't just them, but I'm just going to cover them. There were other investors with money backing it in the car industry. And now where that partnership 
relationship ends is in a disagreement between Durant and Chevrolet. And now you see the essence of Chevrolet was he was pretty much pure racer. That's what he cared about. He really didn't care that much about producing cars unless they were for him to race. And he simply said, I'm done. He sold his shares to Durant and got out of there. Uh, I have a feeling his views on manufacturing vehicles were pretty similar to how Enzo Ferrari felt. And with that separation of partnership, it would be Luis Chevrolet walking away from a car manufacturer that bears his name. Let's talk about some random useless trivia that will always be in my mind. So here we have the Chevrolet bow tie, all right? Now there is some debate on exactly where and what came from, where it means. Some say it's a modified Swiss cross in homage of Louis Chevrolet's homeland. Other, other things I've found is that it was a simply a wallpaper design that Louis Chevrolet saw while he was staying in a hotel in Paris. I don't know which story I like better. Oh, now I have talked plenty and I am plenty capable of talking more, but I think it is best that we take a nice little look around this 1938 Chevrolet Master Deluxe. And then I am going to tell you all about it. for letting me make a video on their absolutely lovely classic car. Thank you. Now, the Chevrolet Master and Master Deluxe was uh, an American passenger vehicle that was created and manufactured between 1933 and 1942. And it was made to replace the Chevrolet 1933 Eagle. And it was the most expensive of its range at the time. Now, another thing to think about is that in 1937, Chevrolet actually spent a fair amount of cash. Hi, Mom. You can be in the video. It's all right. <laughs> Do you have any beer? No. Got a hopadillo? All right, well, I'll be getting a hopadillo. Now, in 1937, Chevrolet had spent a lot of money on research, development, design, planning of their Master Deluxe and Master. And so when 1938 came around, they didn't make a lot of changes. So this is the year 1938. Uh, just a few minor things like the grill, just a few other things. Now, the one big change that they did was frankly not a good idea, and that was increasing the price by 40%. That's crazy. I guarantee you consumers will notice that. You might not be making a change in your model from year to year, but they will notice if the price increases by 40%. And you can imagine with an increase of 40% in their price, which is crazy, that that also meant a big drop in their sales. And you are absolutely right. Their sales plummeted and they weren't the only one. Okay. I forget the exact number, but Dodge was down like 60% or maybe it was 40 don't remember but anyways all of the manufacturers were pretty much in the same boat and why that was is that it just really wasn't a great time for the economy across the world now you've taken a look around this car I showed you it and it is a very handsome vehicle it's a handsome classic car and so with that I have to tell you what the absolutely unimaginative advertising slogan was for this car at the time and uh, they just really missed the mark. So the slogan was, the car that is complete, which is terrible because that frankly implies that their other cars had not been complete. 
Now the Chevy behind me has been outfitted with a 383 stroker. And with every stroker, that means that the crankshaft has been altered to increase the stroke of the pistons. So the increased stroke means more fuel and air. You have increased your displacement without changing the engine block. And you know what more fuel and air means? More horsepower and more torque. The Chevy 383 Stroker is a eight cylinder engine that uses the popular production Chevrolet 350 block and a slightly altered Chevrolet 400 crank. A stock 350 has a piston stroke length of 3.48 inches. The 400 crank changes the 383 to a total stroke of 3.75 inches. This produces a total displacement of 383 cubic inches, thus the name. This displacement means that a Chevy 383 stroker is capable of drawing in a total of 383 cubic inches of air fuel mixture into its cylinder chambers during one cycle of the eight pistons. The Chevy 383 stroker is a eight cylinder engine that uses the popular production Chevrolet 350 block and a slightly altered Chevrolet 400 crank. A stock 350 has a piston stroke length of 3.48 inches. The 400 crank changes the 383 to a total stroke of 3.75 inches. This produces a total displacement of 383 cubic inches, thus the name. This displacement means that a Chevy 383 stroker is capable of drawing in a total of 383 cubic inches of air fuel mixture into its cylinder chambers during one cycle of the eight pistons. All right, guys, it's officially beer 30. Let me go get one. All right, my friends. So I have a tasty Carbock Papadillo IPA. It's really, really good. And as it says right there, Cuidado! It is a 6.6 .6 alcohol by volume, 65 IBU. It is quite a tasty ale. It's actually a favorite of uh, me, my sister, and my mother. Or I should say my mom, my sister, and I. Whatever, grammar. So this is also a Texas beer brewed right outside of Houston. So right inside Houston. I don't know, Houston's really big. I forget what I said about that. But it's located in Houston. Let's drink it. blocks got popular right around 1955 when the Corvette was powered by the 265 cubic inch engine that could put out 195 horsepower and why they gained that popularity and really maintained the popularity was because these engines were easy to customize they were easy to repair and easy to maintain and then in 1967 with the release of the Camaro we would see the 350 small engine block come onto the scene at 295 horsepower and really it became the standard for engine swaps. So pretty much if anybody wants to increase their performance in pre-1967 cars, that's the engine they put in. And now why the 383 stroker, which is what's in the Chevy behind me, is popular is it basically is an easy thing to do. All small block, all the Chevy small block engine parts are pretty much interchangeable. So to upgrade to a 350 or a 383 is pretty cost efficient and an easy way to get a performance upgrade. Now this is an all steel car with a fat man front end. It also has added is a nice throaty Flowmaster 400 and mag wheels. And at this point, I think we should take a look at the interior. Let's go take a nice little peek at the interior, which is quite cushy, also. Hey, Dad. Hey, hey. Shwink, shwink. <laughs> All right. Oh, it's nice in here. Oh, my goodness. So you have the classic gauges. Boy, I wish I was good at lighting, and then you could see that better. Maybe I'll take a better, maybe I'll take a better video of the interior during the day, because it is. It's dark outside. 
So it is a really nice interior and it's actually been outfitted with Vintage Air and Vintage Air makes really quality and good looking air conditioners for classic cars. It's actually a company that is outside of San Antonio, which we're basically neighbors down here in Corpus Christi, Texas. So if you have a classic car that you need air conditioning in, you probably already know, but if you don't know, now you know, Vintage Air. All right, I'm going to twist the camera around so you can see a little of this interior. Here we go. It's nice. Got your classic gauges. Perfect. That center console has been added. Fantastic. Really good, nicely done your interior. Now, at this point, I have a strong feeling I have chatted your little ears off. And at this point in time, it's best we just cheers and we let go, huh? Get it. So if you enjoy these kind of very, very informal, casual, candid car videos, well, then you should certainly press subscribe wherever the button is. And also tell me in the comment lines below, what's your favorite Chevrolet, huh? What was your favorite car in the 1930s? That's a good one too. What do you think of Luis Chevrolet? What did you think of Durant? Obviously there are a lot more details in that partnership that I didn't cover because I don't have the time. And I get tired. I just get tired after I talk too much. You can imagine. And y'all would probably get tired too. So let me know what you think below. Um, and I guess it's time to cheers and say goodbye. Mm -hmm.